Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. I had this apartment manager, let's call him Rick, who is pretty much an absentee landlord. I lived in this tall apartment building, like 25 floors, for over a decade. Despite living just down the hall from me, Rick was distant and impersonal, but our arrangement worked fine. The rent was reasonable, and our deal was, never bother him unless it's a dire emergency. Leaky faucet? Go buy a new one yourself. Oven craps out? Get it replaced, or just grab a new one. Deduct it from the rent money. Lost the receipt? Rick didn't care. He knew appliance costs well enough for me to make a fair estimate. Then a few years back, Rick's wife Tiffany decides she wants to hike up our rent and apparently had plans to illegally rent out my unit as office space once I moved out. She gave me short notice to vacate, but we agreed I'd leave a month early and get that month's rent back, plus my security deposit. Complete 180 from their end after that. The place is totaled. We can't return anything until you fix all this damage. Two biggies. My cats had scratched up the leather legs of the dining table, and my pull-up bar put a couple dents in the nice hardwood doorframe in the kitchen. They blindsided me with a massive list of ridiculous stuff to fix, like, you hung this photo frame here and dented the wall, and this one tile has a tiny chip. This was my busiest work period, but I tried cooperating, got the table legs recovered in leather, patched the photo frame hole, couldn't really do anything about those door frame dents, so told them to just deduct that from the deposit money. Patched that chip tile, too. Did every last little nickel and dime repair, they asked. Dozens of typical wear and tear things, like replacing window screens that were in better shape than when I moved in. I did it all because I trusted Rick to make good after. At the end, he owed me around $3,200 in security deposit refund. He gave me $50. I still need to use that money to fix all those repairs you didn't do properly. If you won't accept the $50, I'm not giving you anything at all. I was furious, but foolishly took the measly $50. Word travels fast in that building, and although I didn't spread gossip, I vented my frustrations to this sweet older lady who lived there. She proceeded to tell everyone in the entire building about how Rick had screwed me over. Tiffany went from Queen Bee of the Mommy Click to a total pariah. Nobody would even speak to her after that. Thought I was skipping town for a different city. But a unit opened up on another floor, so I stuck around. Got to watch their reputations burn while living right under their noses. A year later, the building office calls me with some question about the heating system, and when I stop by, I notice the door frame still has those dents I couldn't fix. Call Rick like, dude, what gives? And he snidely tells me to mind my own business. Five years after that whole fiasco, I'm passing my old unit at like 3 a.m. and notice the lights are still on. Strange, I think, and take a peek. The door is wide open and the place is completely trashed. Cabinets busted, graffiti all over the walls saying stuff like lazy landlord, and yep, those dents in the kitchen door frame are still there, clear as day. Guy never lifted a finger to fix anything, just pocketed my deposit money. By that time, our building had a big community chat group with like 500 tenants. I snapped pics of the whole disaster scene and uploaded them all, exposing how Rick had essentially robbed my deposit after lying about making repairs. A total uproar ensued, tenants chiming in with their own horror stories about shady dealings, more photos of him neglecting maintenance everywhere, videos of his buddies loitering and cursing around kids, Rick got slapped with heavy fines for, one, creating a public nuisance, two, allowing the building to become blighted and hazardous, and three, illegally renting out residential units for commercial use. The icing, management banned his repair crews from entering to do any work for half a year after that, leaving my trashed unit in ruins that entire time while he kept racking up fines and fees. Shorted me a couple hundred bucks on that deposit, wound up losing tens of thousands in unpaid rent, penalties, etc. Greed backfires hard, pal. The next one is an entitled people story. I've lived on my family's ranch for as long as I can remember. My grandparents started it years ago, and my parents took it over when they passed. Now it's my turn to care for the land and animals. Even though ranching is hard work, I wouldn't trade it for anything. This wide open space is in my blood. Part of ranch life is dealing with the occasional difficult neighbor. We've had a few disputes over the years about cattle getting loose or fixing shared fences. Nothing too dramatic, though. At least until Kyle moved in last year. Right away, I could tell we weren't going to see eye to eye. Kyle bought the plot of land right next to ours. It didn't take him long to start making changes. First, he knocked down a bunch of trees to clear space for a big shop and a driveway. Then, he dug out a giant pond. Must have been at least an acre. Looked more like a dang lake to me. I went over and asked Kyle what he was planning on using all that water for. He got real defensive right off the bat. Said it was his land so he could do whatever he wanted. 
I told him I didn't care what he did on his property, but I was worried about all that water so close to my fields. He told me to mind my own business. After that, I kept an eye on Kyle's place whenever I rode the perimeter of our land. His pond just kept getting bigger. It was creeping closer and closer to our property line. The whole thing gave me a bad feeling. One night, we got hit by a massive rainstorm. Worst I'd seen in years. I was up at dawn to check for damage. As I got close to Kyle's, my heart dropped. His giant pond had overflowed from all the rain. There was water gushing downhill into our fields. I jumped in my truck and raced over, but it was too late. At least 10 acres were already flooded. All the work I'd done prepping the soil and planting was wrecked. I felt sick looking at it. Months of effort ruined in one night. As soon as the rain stopped, I drove over to Kyle's place. I banged on his door until he finally opened it. He took one look at me and rolled his eyes. Before I could even say a word, he held up a hand to shut me up. I know what you're gonna say, but that pond overflowing wasn't my fault. Blame the weather, not me. I pointed toward my flooded fields. That's my livelihood, Kyle. Does this look like no big deal to you? You knew that pond was a problem waiting to happen, but you didn't give a damn. He shrugged. Nothing I can do about it now. Just let your fields dry out and replant in the spring. Like it was no problem at all. I wanted to grab him by the shirt and shake some sense into him, but I knew that wouldn't solve anything, so I held my tongue and walked away before I did something I'd regret. Over the next few days, I met with my farm manager and accountant to figure out damages. All told, we estimated around $200,000 to restore the fields and replace the ruined crops. No way could I afford that kind of loss. The only option was to take Kyle to court to recover damages. I sent Kyle a formal letter explaining what he owed me. Didn't think he'd actually pay up, but it was worth a shot. Of course he didn't respond. So the next step was filing a lawsuit. Kyle clearly thought I was bluffing. The day of the hearing, he strolled in wearing jeans and cowboy boots like he was going to a barbecue. If he was trying to look relaxed, it wasn't working. I could see the nervous tick in his jaw from across the courtroom. We stood before the judge and stated our cases. I presented my evidence, photos of the flooded fields, financial records tallying the destruction, and testimony from my farm manager verifying it all. Kyle didn't really have a defense prepared. He thought my lawsuit was a joke. After reviewing the facts, the judge ruled in my favor. Kyle was found negligent since he knew the risks of an overflow but took no preventative steps. The court ordered him to pay me $217,000 to cover damages and losses. Kyle's face turned red as a beet when they read the amount. I almost felt bad for him. But then I remembered 10 acres of ruined crops and all my sympathy dried up. He brought this on himself. After the hearing, Kyle came up to me and extended his hand. He said he wanted to apologize and make amends. I cautiously shook his hand told him actions speak louder than words. He said he'd start making payments on what he owed straight away. We'd see if he followed through on that promise. Over the next year, Kyle stayed true to his word. Each month he sent a check to cover a portion of the damages. By the end of the year, the full amount was paid off. I was finally able to repair the flooded fields and replant. Kyle also took steps to fix the issues with his pond. He brought in excavators to make an overflow drainage route to the creek downhill from his property, and he set up an early flood monitoring system with rain gauges and alarms. We still don't have much in common, but these days when I pass Kyle working on his land, I give a nod. He nods back. Might not sound like much, but it's progress, and it's enough to keep the peace in this little corner of the countryside we both call home. The next one is a petty revenge story. A year and a half ago, my partner and I bought our first home. It's a lovely little three-bedroom, semi-attached house with a front patio. There's no backyard because another house is attached at the back. Since moving in, it's been wonderful. All our neighbors are lovely and we've gotten along well with them all. Well, we've tried to. Our neighbor next to us is a bit overbearing regarding what we do in our garden. There were three small trees on our side of the fence next to her property. The only large plants in the patio area were these three trees, a row of conifers by the road and gate to provide privacy, and a wisteria growing on the front of the house. The trees had grown over and were hanging into her garden. Just after we moved in, the first thing she said was that the trees needed trimming. We didn't want to upset anyone, so we cut them back and removed any branches hanging over to her side. At that point, I got a bit carried away with the shears and trimmed the trees way back. Don't worry, they're growing upright and not sprawling anymore. One of them, next to the shed, was small and struggling, so I decided to cut it down completely. It was about four feet tall and didn't extend over the fence. When she returned, she leaned over the fence while we were in our garden and calmly tried to tell us that she'd lost privacy in her garden. I say calmly, but she was almost spitting feathers through gritted teeth. We just said, oh, they'll grow back. 
and explained that we needed to clear out the trees because the wisteria was attaching itself to them and climbing into the roof tiles. She replied, Well, just don't cut them anymore. Once again, we'd only been in the house for three months and didn't want to upset anyone. As a woman, I understood her personality, but my partner didn't yet grasp it. That would soon change. She then asked what we were planning to do with the shed. This garden shed is adorable. It has a little vine growing around the roof trim with flowers dangling down. I wanted to paint it a dark plum purple to make the white flowers stand out even more. When I mentioned this, she said, Oh, you can't paint it that color. I'll have to look at it. I think you should just leave it as it is or stain it the current color. I was practically spitting feathers through clenched teeth. I couldn't believe the audacity of someone telling me what I could or couldn't do with my shed simply because she'd have to see it. The only part she'd see is the back that sticks above the fence, which we can't even reach to paint. But again, my partner said he didn't want to upset the neighbors, so we left it alone. Fast forward to yesterday. We had friends over making pizzas in the garden and catching up. She had just returned home and leaned over the fence again. She recently had some work done in her garden to drop the curb and create a small driveway. I said it looked really good and made small talk while she leaned over. My partner mentioned that the fence between us needed cleaning because it had turned green and we wanted to paint it. Well, it's my fence, you know, she snapped. Her sudden change in tone was shocking. My friend sat there staring and I felt a strange secondhand embarrassment for her. My partner said, that's fine, but can we clean our side with the karcher? Her response, I use a paintbrush with bleach water to clean it, so that's how you can do it. My partner and she went back and forth in a relatively calm manner, but she grew more irate. Sensing the tension, I told our friends, Okay, it's getting cold. Let's go inside. Once we were inside, our friends immediately said, What a jerk. After this, my partner asked, What color did you want the shed again? So today, we're going out to buy the most amazing shade of purple to paint the shed. I'll wait until she's around and do it with my AirPods on full blast so I can't hear her complaining. I know it isn't the best revenge, but after living here for a year and a half, I'm finally getting my pretty little shed. The next one is a malicious compliance story. When I was a teenager, my extended family, my parents, sister, me, aunt, uncle, and cousins, making a total of eight people, went on our annual multi-day cycling tour. Due to bad weather, we had to reschedule and ended up renting an apartment in Ticino, Switzerland, which had enough beds for all of us, but only one shower. Finding accommodations for eight people in high season isn't easy, so this was our only option. One late afternoon, we returned from a long day cycling the steep mountains around Lake Maggiore. We had covered a few hundred, maybe even a thousand meters of elevation in a very humid climate, so you can imagine how sweaty and hungry we all were. I should add that this was long before e-bikes were a thing. We did these cycling vacations every year, going back to when we were in elementary school. It was always the two families who were very close, and yes, we were, and still are, crazy about cycling. To prevent fights, we always decided on an order for the shower as soon as we got back to the apartment. I was supposed to be third in line, but my aunt insisted that I give her my shower slot because she needed to be finished sooner than me. Most days, the adults cooked dinner and we all ate at the apartment, so this made sense to me as I figured she wanted to shower before starting to cook. As soon as she was in the shower, I found out we were supposed to go to a restaurant for dinner that day, so there wasn't any reason for my aunt to jump the queue other than being last in line and probably thinking there wouldn't be any hot water left for her. I tried to get in the shower next, but my sister and cousins insisted that I lost my spot by letting my aunt jump the queue and that I had to wait until all of them were finished. Everyone was in a hurry, as we were all really hungry after all the cycling and wanted to leave for the restaurant as soon as possible. Cue malicious compliance. While waiting to finally get into the shower, I secretly snacked on a packet of nuts to soothe my hungry stomach and patiently waited my turn. When I finally got in the shower, I washed my long hair, used conditioner, rinsed again, and made sure to put on lotion after showering. I even blow-dried my hair thoroughly, despite it being hot outside. By that time, my family was banging on the bathroom door, urging me to hurry up as everyone was very hungry. When I finally got out of the bathroom, my family scolded me for taking so long and making them wait while they were starving. I told them that my aunt had tricked me out of my spot in the shower line and that none of them were willing to let me shower earlier. What did they expect when they made the only person with long hair shower last? Well, they always made sure I was one of the first to shower after that. On every vacation. The next one is an entitled people story. I staffed a marathon recently. I was stationed at the finish line, right in front of the medical tent. Anyone in need of medical attention could go straight from the finish area to the medical tent and I helped guide them there. The hospitality area with food, drink, and other vendors was also near the finish line. To get there, runners had to go to the exit, which was past the medical tent. After that, they went on the other side of the medical tent and arrived at the hospitality area. 
This route took about 30 seconds longer than cutting through in front of the medical tent area. There was a fence separating the medical area from the hospitality area, manned by other staff to make sure that regular folks did not cut through. Staff were allowed through, though. Keeping the medical area uncrowded makes it easier for people to get the medical attention they needed. One of the things I did was to screen runners. Anyone needing medical attention I sent to the medical tent, while those going anywhere else I directed to the exit. Some runners, seeing what they thought was a more direct route to the hospitality area, wanted to cut through the medical tent area. After confirming they did not need medical attention, I directed them to the exit, politely and professionally. Almost everyone was fine with that, but not this one woman. Five and a half hours after the start of the marathon, after nearly all the other runners had finished, an entitled woman tried to cut through. I told her politely and professionally, the exit was that way. But I just ran 26 miles, she whined. Yes, and the exit is that way, I said. Or something like that. She tried to make her case, but I did not yield. Eventually, she poutingly went around. Here are my mental responses to her. I just ran 26 miles. Uh, are you sure that ran is the right word here? Yes, and so did thousands of other people. They all went around. What makes you so special that you need to take a shortcut? Congratulations! Are your legs going to fall off if you walk another 50 yards now? Sheesh. The next one is an entitled parent's story. I am so tired of constantly being unable to express my concerns to my mother without her crying, guilt-tripping me, or giving me the silent treatment. Basically, I live abroad, and my mom asked if she and my cousin could come visit me this summer. I told her absolutely that I could take one week off of work, maybe even eight days, to host her and my cousin and show them a good time around my city. I live with my partner, and he was even willing to stay at his parents' house for the seven to eight days because he is a remote worker, and we only live in a very small one-bedroom apartment. Eventually, my mom buys her flight tickets, and she is booked for 16 days. Mind you, me and my mother are often very opposite. She is impulsive, emotional, moody, and very anxious. I am a very type A person, and I was very much parentified growing up by her. I was obviously upset because I did not sign up for her to stay 16 days. That's insane. I told her that she absolutely had to book a hotel for the second week because I can't ask my partner to be away from our home for that long, and I don't have that much time off of work. Ever since she told me she bought a flight to visit for 16 days, I have been annoyed. I find it stressful when family visits even for just a week because I start to feel like a camp counselor. It just overwhelms me to try and make sure everyone is having a good time, having things planned every day, being out of my normal routine. But for one week I can handle it, 16 days is a whole other story. Anyway, I tried to have an honest conversation with her and tell her I think she should shorten her trip. She has a changeable flight. I feel like she isn't going to be comfortable traveling around this big city without me guiding her because she is already very anxious naturally. Also, I live in a very expensive city, and I think she will struggle financially to pay for a hotel for an entire week. Also, my cousin is a bit of an airhead, so I don't really think she'll be much help. Of course, I try talking to her calmly, and she starts crying and accusing me of ruining her vacation, that I am so hard-headed and don't listen, that she never gets to do anything and I'm ruining it for her and that now she doesn't even want to come because I am not being welcoming, etc. I just can't handle this. I find it so hard to have a conversation with her when she starts manipulating me. I know my mother, she is not this adventurous, easygoing person on vacation. And now I will have the emotional burden of worrying about her and my cousin for the week I can't spend with them because neither one of them are very capable. Am I being unreasonable here? Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.